Hello, I'm D.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library on Insight New Mexico with uh, Arturo Sandoval, founder and president of the nonprofit Center for Southwest Culture. Uh, many of you may be a little unfamiliar with the center, uh, but since its founding in 1991, it has raised more than $16 million uh, uh, to help uh, uh, healthy indigenous and uh, Latino communities form, uh, to work with um, uh, educational projects and uh, with cultural work as well. Arturo is the president of the Quiviric Coalition. Uh, he's chair of, of 516 Arts. He's been active in our world in New Mexico ever since he was a child. He's always been in the lead, helping other people. Uh, trying to figure out ways to make other people's lives better. And it's just an honor to have him here with us um, uh, today. We're going to talk a little bit about the center itself and then uh, want to talk a lot about a new project, uh, which is um, agricultural co-ops. So it's wonderful to have you with us, and um, I can't wait for the conversation. VB, it's uh, great to be here. It's uh, I know we've known each other for a long, long time, and I know of all the incredible, great work you've done, and uh, I've read all your really seminal works on Albuquerque, New Mexico, and City on the Edge of, what is the name of that book, City on the, City at the End of the World. At yeah. the End of the World. Yeah. It's just fantastic writing, so, Thank you so much. good to be here with you. So I'm wondering, what, what caused you in 1991 uh, to start the Center for Southwest Culture up? You know, I mean, it's an incredibly ambitious and, and uh, powerful idea. And you've been working it for such a terribly long time with such success. What was the motive? So, VB, you know, the uh, the center really grew out of my lifelong commitment to social justice causes. So I, I graduated high school in 1965. I'm a child of the 60s. I was very involved uh, coming right out of high school in social justice issues. Um, I worked on land grant issues in northern New Mexico in the early 60s when Tijerina was shooting up the courthouse up in Tierra Maria. Uh, I helped form uh, the United Mexican American students at UNM, and we in turn uh, helped found Chicano Studies and Chicano Student Services. Um, I worked on the very first Earth Day in 1970 out of Washington, D.C. I was on the national or organizing team. I organized the Western U.S. Uh, I was very active in the peace movement. I was a uh, uh, war resistor against the Vietnam War, and and I was uh, I went I deliberately refused induction, and I was uh, tried and convicted and sentenced to a three-year prison oh, term yeah. for refusing, and uh, and that three-year term was subsequently uh, uh, deferred by the judge, and I did three years of alternate service and probation. So I've been involved all of my life in issues of human rights, civil rights, and I know that people need to find expression. So I, I've always been interested in cultural, uh, especially Latino culture, Native American culture, as a way to help people find themselves and to express who they are as human beings, uh, as members of minority members in a dominant society. So the center really grew out of my lifelong commitment to social justice and cultural work. And I thought, I wonder if I could uh, take what I'm doing on evenings and weekends and make it my uh, calling. And so the center grew out of that effort to try to spend all of my time working with community. And so we've been at it now for 23 years with the center, but I've actually been involved here in New Mexico with social justice issues for about 46, 48 years. I always wonder about you know, how do you keep things like that going? I mean, what's the... what's What's the machinery? You know, what's the engine that makes it work? Because you know, 23 years is a long time, and this is, I'm sure, it must have had some many, many hard times. Yes, uh, you know, running a nonprofit center is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> uh, all of our funding is soft money. Uh, and we've had difficult periods over these past 23 years. It's not always been easy, but it's, I think, a question, a couple of things we've been able to do correctly. One is we're lean and mean. I keep a very small uh, core staff, and I, and I run essentially a virtual center. So when I need subject matter experts, I hire people based on uh, current contracts and my availability to pay them over shorter periods of time. And my core staff... Uh, my long-term employees at the center tend to be a very small group. So that's a, permitted us to survive mm. when we don't have as many 
resources, but basically it's a it's an effort that I have to spend basically 40 to 50 percent of my time not doing the center's work, but basically finding the resources yes. to do the center's work. Right. We get most of our funding from federal government agencies, from foundations, from private donors. That's where almost all of it comes from, uh -huh. and that percentage moves up and down. I would say currently we're getting... 40% of our income from foundations and private donors and 60% from uh, government contracts. Wow. That's how we do it, but it's a constant search for resources. Wow. You're never there. It's you're always I'm always up late worrying about uh, how we're going to pay next month's rent, but but we've built some sustainability into what we do and we've gotten better at it. So we're in much better shape now than we were 22 years ago. You know that sounds a lot like the Mercury. You know we're uh, you know we're always always struggling, always looking for ways to sustain ourselves too. So I'm my heart goes out to you, and I'm really in admiration for how much you managed to do. Could you tell us what kinds of things you, um, in general, have been dealing with over the last 24 years? What kind of projects? And then and then let's get into some uh, specific ones. So our mission statement at the center is basically we want to help create healthy. Uh, Latino, Mexicano, and indigenous communities, and we do it in three different ways. We do it through economic development, we do it through culture, cultural work, cultural programming, and we do it through informal education. Those are the three areas we focus on at the center as a way to create healthy communities. So when we're talking about healthy communities, we mean healthy in terms of their income, healthy in terms of their uh, psychology, healthy in terms of their mental health, healthy in terms of their worldview, the fact that they have an education and that they can interact with the world uh, in a very high level, at a very high level. So that's our mission. And so we've done it through, by being presenters, we've brought uh, cultural groups up from Mexico to perform here across the state. We've sent groups from here to perform in Mexico. Wow. We've done cultural exchange. We've done, uh, for example, we did a cultural exchange program between Zia Pueblo and uh, community of Raramuri in northern Mexico oh, because wow. the uh, Zia felt that they might have some connection to the Raramuri and they wanted to go see if in fact there were some of the same stories and some of the same background. So we were able to raise money for that and we were the project coordinators and we spent two weeks dancing under the moon up in the Sierra Tarumara for oh, two weeks. God with Zia elders and with elders from the Raramuri community. So we've had uh, magical moments in our journey, and that's just one example of the kind of work we do. So as I as I look at your website, and I, which is a wonderful website, it's beautifully designed, and I just see this literally endless list of projects and things and plans, and not plans, but activities, activities, activities. Could you get uh, specific with uh, and sort of name Name a number of your most favorite ones and kind of describe them a little bit to us. So one of the missions of the center to help develop uh, healthy communities is we're also an incubator, an NGO incubator. So we take on a lot of projects and we become fiscal sponsor. We do all the reporting for them to uh, IRS and state government. We, we give them the opportunity to be able to obtain funding from sources that can only give to uh, nonprofits and that's like foundations and if there's a need in the community then we help them emerge as their own standalone NGO organizations so among those projects have been one million bones which just took place last June yeah. in Washington DC and really raised well. quite uh, several million dollars for uh, for victims of uh, genocide in Africa uh, we've done so many projects, I can't even begin to list them. Yeah. Uh, but we've done a, a enormous number of projects. We currently are sponsoring a project in Cuba where people can access a link on our website to see the kind of sustainable uh, environmental and su sustainable uh, economic development work that Cubans are doing every day on the island as a way to build their own economy because they're under enormous stress there. Yes. So is northern New Mexico, so is New Mexico. We're under an enormous economic stress and cultural stress here in New Mexico. So we're sharing stories through video, through a video link with Cubans who are on the cutting edge of developing sustainable models for economic development, for cultural work, for environmental protection. And we're sharing that with our people here in New Mexico. So that's our one of our current projects. So we've been involved in this kind of international communications work for years and years, and we have sponsored such a diverse number of 
projects, I would just uh, recommend that people go to our website yeah, and they'll yeah. get a much broader sense. But it's a, we have a broad reach and we're deeply committed to community. So uh, currently we're sponsoring about 15 discrete projects through the center. And we've wow. done that sustainably for about the last 15, 20 years. One of the ones that I'm really the most interested in because because of the internet aspects and other things is ArtSpark. It's a great name. Uh, I don't. I know our readers would love to hear about this. So ArtSpark is one of our sponsored projects, but the brainchild of a woman named Christine Mel, Mel, Melrude. And Christine had this idea that there's a lot of individual artists and smaller projects uh, that are emerging in the community, but they don't generally get support. So the ArtSpark model is she supports them overall provides an umbrella organization for them and she does uh, online fundraising for them and then people can donate to a menu of artists or art projects here in New Mexico and most of the donors come in from out of state so it's new money coming into the state and it's targeted to real specific artists and art projects that on their own would not have the capacity to raise this kind of money so she's an incredible uh, entrepreneur for the arts and she's a, a champion of the arts and Christine is just amazing and we're real proud to partner with her to make this happen so she's been at this at least five or six years and has helped quite a number of individual artists and smaller arts groups that don't have access to people that do have money or don't have the capacity to write grants or for whatever reason simply or they're artists and the part of the brain that requires you to do a business just isn't working as well <laughs> and she's and Christine steps in through ArtSpark and makes that happen and that's one of the long-term projects that are sponsored through our center. One of the things that I'm really interested in now is the is the range in in in, in a spectrum I guess of your cooperative activities. They sound really rich and, and diverse and uh, very, very interesting. So uh, the idea of co-ops uh, uh, resonated with me very early when I was a VISTA volunteer way back in 1967 in a rural community in northern New Mexico. I got involved in starting a number of co-ops. One was a grocery uh, f uh, food co-op oh. for people so they could get food at a more reasonable price in isolated communities. We did a lot of extractive in, uh, natural resource co-ops like Latillas and Flagstone co-ops. Oh uh, and so I saw the power of working collectively for economic gain. And uh, it took me a number of years to get back to that concept, but about four or five years ago uh, at the center through our strategic planning, we decided to create wealth and the opportunity for income, for 21st century income, for mostly rural uh, Chicano, Mexicano, and indigenous communities, that creating co-ops would be a great way to put money in their pockets. Yeah. So there's limits here in New Mexico, as you know, VB. We have very little access to uh, investment capital. Uh, we do not have uh, high educational levels. Uh, people that do have graduate degrees or PhDs usually are forced to leave the state to seek work elsewhere. So people that are left in our uh, Mexicano, Chicano, indigenous communities tend to be people with less education, fewer opportunities. What we do have, however, is we have land and water rights. All the Pueblos have senior Aboriginal water rights. They have arable land. Uh, right behind them are most of the Mexicano, Chicano communities in northern New Mexico. They have acequia water rights. They have arable land. But they're not applying it in a way that generates a 21st century income. So through the co-op, what we do is say, look, we have to rethink existing resources to create 21st century incomes for ourselves. How do we do that? Well, instead of farming the five acres my great-grandfather left me in alfalfa, which will give me maybe $2,800 an acre per year, I can generate forty to 50000 sustainably, forty to $50,000 an acre planting organic fruits and vegetables. So what we're doing is creating a whole range of organic farming co-ops in northern New Mexico and getting people to switch from alfalfa to organic fruits and vegetables, number one. Number two, we know we're in drought. So instead of doing the traditional acequia flood irrigation to, to keep these crops alive, as a part of our ongoing education and, and uh, 
and the conversation with these communities, almost all of our co-ops have converted to drip irrigation. We save over 50% of traditional use of water. So in a drought situation, that's great. Plus, it makes us sustainable. So in the past three or four years, we've been able to create about 15 co-ops. Most of them are organic farming co-ops in northern New Mexico and here in the mid-Rio uh, Valley. So... Uh, that model is working really well. Co-ops, as you know, are the traditional model among Native Americans in the sense that they're all about collaborative decisions. Through They are tied to each other for decisions through clans yeah. uh, and through caciques. And in Mexicano-Chicano communities, historically, uh, land grants are nothing more than communal models, which is all a co-op is. It's a way of working communally for the common good of all. And our co-ops are... Uh, a, a capitalist model that is permitted where you have one member, one vote, and the members are the owners. So our co-op members farm the land and they own all of the all of the all of the net income that comes from that. They make every decision on a two-thirds vote, um, and you cannot acquire additional voting rights. And no one can become dominant in a co-op. It's one person, one vote. If you die, your vote goes with you. And and it keeps uh, it's a model that's both democratic and in a capitalist model is also successful. So it's working at a very very profound level. We're very very excited at our results, and uh, we hope to generate and create hundreds of co-ops across New Mexico in the next ten years. Is our goal. So that's our big baby. At at this moment, we're really into it. There's another piece to this. Uh, the co-op thing is you can't only put more money into people's pockets. People that have been oppressed for 160 years or 170 years, in the case of Native America, for 400 years in New Mexico, you can't merely increase their income because there's other issues that come with being colonized for so many years. And that is, there's issues of mental health, there's issues of drug abuse. As you know, Rio Reba County has the highest per capita deaths from heroin overdose in the country and also from prescribed medications. So why is that? It's because these cultures are imploding. They cannot withstand the pressures of colonization over 170 years. So the issue for us is not just putting more money in their pockets, but providing education so that they come into the light, so that people understand that I can't, with this extra money we're generating, can't go and buy more whiskey and continue to be an alcoholic or to buy drugs. No, what they have to do is understand that the money needs to go into a college fund for their children, that it's more important to get a health plan than it is to buy a new truck. That, and that comes with education and valuing themselves and valuing their families. So we have another division, our education division is called La Carpa. So La Carpa is the concept of the traveling circus, the tent, the traveling tent circus that in Spanish colonial times and in Mexican colonial times here in New Mexico and across Latin America was the way nation states were formed. And that is, there was before there was mass communications, people would learn about what the president was doing in Mexico City through these traveling uh, circuses, oh where you'd have uh, John Stewart's predecessors basically making commentary, not only giving you information about what was going on in Mexico City, let's say, but also... Uh, what the president's wife was wearing, that she looked like a big yellow canary. With She had bought her clothes in France, but she's too fat, and they'd make fun of her. But at the same time, they'd be building nation-state. So through our concept of La Carpa, our, our plan is to provide just-in-time education, needed education both for adults and youth, uh, to help our youth learn to really write well and get them into post-secondary regardless of what their, their public school education is, and working with adults to give them the necessary information they need so that their kids apply for colleges, they know what Pell Grants are, yeah. uh, that they can apply for assistance if they need help uh, with senior care, so that they, because in rural communities they often don't know. It's the lack of knowledge, that, and knowledge is power. So through the CARPA, we're building that other piece to our economic development uh, uh, work through CODESE, where the CARPA then comes in and creates the whole human being, much like Pablo Freire talked about and other people. So you need, people are both physical beings and spiritual beings. So you have to feed both the body and the spirit. So our goal is first feed the body, get them healthy, get good housing for them, make sure you put their, they have a, an income that uh, gives them options with net disposable income, and then provide the education that gives them an opportunity to then say, this is how I choose to spend the resources I now have. 
It's to create a healthy family, healthy community. So that's what we're building uh, through Kodas. And it's obviously not going to happen overnight, but we got into this situation over the last uh, three, 400 years. It's going to take us more than five years to do this. So almost all of our horizons for uh, success are based on 10-year uh, windows. So we look at 10-year horizons in our work. So the short-term issues we run into don't really discourage us because our view is from here to 10 years what can we achieve successfully and then we have another 10 years behind that and there will be others that follow in my footsteps to keep it going. I wanted to talk briefly about that that idea of time and space because uh, for example my great grandfather Leonardo Salazar was a, a member of the Tecolote land grant in San Miguel County along mm -hmm. close to the Rio Pecos. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up moving to San Juan, San Jose on the Rio Pecos. My grandmother, my grandmother on my mom's side, my maternal grandmother, Margarita Salazar, was born in 1888. She related to me a story uh, that in 1896, when she was eight years old, she remembers coming out of the rancho there in San Miguel County. And there's her dad and her uncles dressed with white hoods. They were Goras Blancas. Oh, my God. Were so, they were, so I have a direct tied to the Goras Blancas through family oral history that Leonardo Salazar, my great-grandfather, was fighting for issues of civil rights and protecting land and water. So our work is placed in the context of a hundred year uh, change. So our center is based on the idea that we're in this for the long haul. We know that the Emancipation Proclamation was passed in 1864, but the Civil Rights Act wasn't signed until 1964. And, and, and Afro-Americans in this country still have serious issues of access to everything that's good in our society. So we take the same view at the center that small issues don't slow us down. And if, if we have trouble this year and we don't have funding, uh, I like to use... Call, I like to use the economic development model and, and to sustain the center. I call it the uh, uh, frijoles de olla model that my mom used. That is, she'd put on a pot of beans every day because I was one of 11 kids. And then I would tell her at the end of the day, Mom, can Eduardo come and have supper with us because we're playing out here. Can you, we can we have him sit with us? And she'd say, absolutely, son. I'll just add a little water and salt to the bean pot. So instead of getting 25 beans, we'd all sort of get a smaller bowl with 18, but Eduardo would get his 18. So we have that kind of view that we can be sustainable, that we don't have access to major capital investment, but we don't need it. We have other resources. We're just not using them well. And that's our work through the CODESE, and, and that's the main work of the center that we've uh, redirected our work in the last four or five years to that model, that holistic approach to healing communities and individuals. Uh, you wrote an article called La Familia once about the best social organization when it's working. And I'd love you to expand on that just a little bit because it's a beautiful piece. So there's no question. As I, as I was talking to you earlier, I came, uh, I was born and raised in Española in northern New Mexico, and I was one of 11 children. So there was a lot of internal organizing going on all the time. <laughs> and uh, eight of us were boys and only three girls. So my mom absolutely needed to organize us in, within the family to make just the daily life go on. So yeah. we all learned at an early age how to sew, how to iron clothes, how to cook, yeah. how to wash dishes, and also how to chop wood and kill a chicken and pluck its feathers and all the other stuff, simply because of need. But what occurred to me over time and, and in my work, and it's now been an integral part of our work, is when you get a family unit and, or an extended family unit that is working well, that is has men good mental health, uh, that is has good communication where there's love and where the family really has a deep deep abiding commitment to each other you can you can conquer the world so in Kodese and our co-ops uh, our secret to success has been that we develop all of our co-ops around extended families so all of our co-ops are based are built around families. So we have a co-op, for example, in the South Valley called Organic Acres del Valle del Sur, and they're farming at the Hubble House, the, the historic oh, right. Hubble House. So that's the Torres family. That's all, it's one extended family. It's three brothers and two first cousins and assorted uh, wives, spouses, and a couple of friends, and they threw in a couple of Chicanos. They're Mexicanos. And there's a couple of Chicanos kicking around the edges. But the leadership, the core, the the glue that's really holding that co-op together is the Torres family. 
they're healthy, they love each other, they work together, and, they're, and they are just being so successful. We're using that with all of our co-ops. In northern New Mexico, it's the Valdez family, the Juan Bautista Valdez, the descendants of, of the Juan Bautista Valdez land grant in Cañones in Rio Riva County. So the president is the great, great, great granddaughter of Juan Bautista Valdez, and her name is Eugenia Valdez, and she's Gallegos now because she married... Uh, Gallegos, but she's president of the land grant. She's president of our co-op. Her sisters in the co-op. Her husband, her children, and then we've added other people in the community. So you build. We're building our model around healthy families, one family extended, an extended family, and then we add other members of the community that show an interest and willingness to want to put in the effort and the work to be successful also. And that that concept of the family needs to be re we need to keep supporting families we need to keep nurturing families we need to teach families how to love each other and we've lost a lot of that uh in the last 50 100 years but the the basic instincts are still there and we and we're proving we're actually proving not just talking about it we're proving that healthy families can change the world and that's what we're doing through our co-ops could you tell us a little bit about how la carpa is a teaching entity actually operates. I know there's a lot of teachers who, who are in our audience and I'm sure they'd be fascinated. So the idea of La Carpa is how do we get information to people in a non-traditional way that they can absorb it and actually use it in their daily life. So we have a, pro a new project, for example, uh, starting in the South Valley. So our partners in, in, in this project, and I'll explain it to you as a way to show how we make it uh, work in real life, is we're working with the new Valle de Oro uh, Wildlife Refuge. It's, it's the oh, old great. crisis dairy, sure. it's 570 yeah. acres. They're converting it into, a lot of it into wetlands for wildlife. Uh, and so this, we proposed through La Carpa, and we got the funding for it, to work with South, uh, with the Valle de Oro Wildlife Refuge and with South Valley Academy, which is a public charter school. 90%, 100% of their students are Mexicanos and Chicanos. Exactly. And they're a great, uh, charter public school also in the South Valley. So what we're doing through our La Carpa project is we are integrating uh, field trips to the to the uh, Valle de Oro and we're bringing Latino PhD scientists from Sandia Labs uh, to talk about issues of uh, hy hydro hydrologic systems, all the water systems and how they're interrelated, and the ecosystems that we have here in the South Valley. So the scientists will be talking at, uh, at different strands of that of those, that overview. Uh, at the same time, we've recruited some curanderos and traditional herbalists among the Chicanos and Native Americans down in the valley from Isleta, Pueblo, and other places mm -hmm. to then talk about how they live off the land and what you know, like there's chimaja and there's verdulagas and there's all these wild uh, vegetables that you that feed people and fed people for centuries and also how they use herbs for healing and things like that. So we give the kids an incredible world view of how to see the world around them, the physical world, and how important it is for them to worry and protect. And uh, because under ecosystems, you talk about climate change, you talk about drought, what can we do to mitigate that? And they're going to be doing a lot of hands-on uh, projects under the leadership of these Latino scientists and these curanderos on site at the uh, wildlife refuge. And I guarantee you that's going to be an educational science education uh, project that they'll never forget. So we were just talking about, uh, about the co-ops not being exclusively held to, uh, to agricultural enterprises. Right. Ecotourism, particularly too, and and then uh, family and motherhood issues as well. Could you briefly describe those things to us? Yes. So through Codice, our interest isn't in just in agriculture for the sake of agriculture. Our real commitment is to is to creating some wealth using existing resources. So northern New Mexico, particularly, uh, not only is it great opportunity for us to create organic farming uh, co-ops, but we're also doing ecotourism co-ops. And the idea there is there's this long land-based culture that's unique to the United States, both among the Puebloans. Pueblo Indians and uh, the Chicano Mexicano communities that have been there for 300 years. So what we've done is form some co-ops where we use knowledge that's already in the community and resources. So instead of having local people complain about how the Forest Service took away our our lands, what we say is let's use those lands because they're forests and people in Germany don't have forests mostly and people in, in Manhattan certainly don't have mm -hmm. access to open space and beautiful vistas and the forests that we do here. You know the forests, let's bring people in and show them what we know 
in terms of the landscape and let's share our traditional culture so we take them out on horseback we show them all these beautiful physical uh, landscapes and we and we have a cultural uh, lens through which they see that that physical landscape and then they come back to our villages and there our co-op members then do matanzas and we sing uh, traditional songs we talk about the uh, penitente brotherhood and how wonderful and important they were in keeping our communities alive uh, we show them traditional Rio Grande style weaving and so people leave with an authentic experience respecting our culture and with a sense that they are experiencing something they will never experience anywhere else in the United States, and that's a, and that's a fact. So we do that. We also do co-ops. We started a couple of co-ops working in uh, uh, with the Partnership for Community Action here in in the Bernalillo County, where Mexican women are trained. They own a co-op. It's a it's a co-op of Mexican women, uh, immigrant women, who know about all the resources available to new immigrant families coming up. So what they do is they provide peer-to-peer -peer training. Oh to these women and they get third party payments so that they make a living at it so the mexican mothers that are members of the co-op get paid to teach other immigrant women coming up what social services are available uh, what education is available because they come up not knowing what the systems are in the u.s much like if you and i were to move to mexico city we'd need someone to tell us what are the what services are available yeah, what yeah. health care services yeah. what's this public transportation system like just basic life skills that they need to be able to help their children become healthy people here in this country so we're doing all kinds of co-ops and it's resonating at a very deep level and we're very very pleased with the results so far well this has been honestly just an absolutely wonderful conversation it's so it's just inspiring how how can our how can our audience be a part of 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 the Center for Southwest Culture. Um, can, is there any way they can reach you and contribute or help in any way? You know, the single biggest thing we need is people, people ideas, people are interested in, uh, that have some specific expertise that might be willing to either offer it uh, as a contribution to help these communities. That would be our single biggest need because if people are, get, if we can get people engaged in this, uh, <clears throat> the power of an individual is just priceless. Uh, usually people say, well, send us money, but really I'm more interested in finding individuals who have some specific skills that could help us because I need help. We're a small staff. Uh, we're totally uh, stretched beyond our limit, but we're doing it anyway. So if there's anyone that's interested that has some skills that they think might be valuable for the kind of cooperative development work we're doing or educational work, uh, boy, we could sure use individuals that would be, be willing to donate some of their expertise and time to us because the need is so huge here in New Mexico, as you know. Thank you so very, very much. I hope to have you back, and maybe we can, maybe in the fall, we can do an update on what's happening in some of these projects. And it's just been wonderful. Great, VB. Really a pleasure being here, and uh, really proud of the work you guys are doing. And we wish you all the success. As you move forward. Thank you so much.